Hey everyone, this is part two of a video trilogy on what is known as scientific consensus. I'm going to explore a few examples of how the scientific consensus has changed over time and also the scientific theories that they're based upon so we can understand how they change. I'm going to focus more on modern examples, sticking to the latter half of the 20th century mostly, uh, because science really operates differently today than it did several hundred years ago. But first, it's important to understand what scientific theories represent before we can understand how they change. Put simply, a scientific theory is an explanation or model about the physical universe that explains observed phenomena with a high degree of predictive power. In other words, it takes data we've accumulated and seeks to find the best explanation for it. An explanation that has to be tested rigorously, explains as much of the data as possible with the fewest holes, and is useful in making accurate predictions. As more data is accumulated, these theories will be refined and the explanations will become more nuanced. Or in some cases, a theory will be overturned almost completely and be replaced with another theory that has higher explanatory power. The latter doesn't happen very often. They're what physicist and philosopher of science Thomas Kuhn called paradigm shifts, in which new approaches for looking at a particular field or question are developed due to new findings that cause a considerable shift in evolution in scientific knowledge. This occurred when Einstein developed the theory of relativity that supplanted Newtonian or classical mechanics. Classical mechanics is still useful today, say for example in engineering, but relativity simply has greater explanatory power. It too will likely be updated in time, since it doesn't adequately address interactions between extremely small particles. It's what we have quantum mechanics for. Time will tell what theory may be developed and accepted next. These next few examples are not so much how scientific consensus changes, but more so how they develop and replace folk wisdom or previously held medical assumptions. In 1956, British epidemiologist Alice Stewart published a study reporting on an increased incidence of childhood cancer as a result of fetal x-rays. Her findings were initially harshly criticized, including by other prominent epidemiologists, and her methods often regarded as unsound. She was essentially castigated by much of the scientific establishment, and funds were not made plentiful for her ongoing efforts. After two decades, other scientists were finally able to replicate her results, and Stewart's findings were vindicated, and medical x-rays during pregnancy were largely reduced. In the late 1950s, American epidemiologist Ansel Keys published the first paper of the now famous Seven Countries study, which was the first major study to identify high serum cholesterol as a major risk factor for coronary heart disease. This eventually became known as the lipid hypothesis, for which a consensus formed in support of by the mid-1970s after more and more lines of evidence verified the findings of this initial study. There still exists some controversy within the medical field and some unfortunate noise all over the internet about this subject, but the scientific consensus very much remains strong today. This will be a subject I explore in more detail in a future video. Until the mid-1980s, it was widely believed that stress was the primary cause of stomach ulcers. Well, now I've got my proof. You've stewed yourself into a duodenal ulcer until Australian scientists Dr. Barry Marshall and Dr. Robin Warren discovered a bacterium, Helicobacter pylori, that was present in the stomachs of patients with ulcers. The initial reception of the scientific community was that of skepticism and intense scrutiny. Now wait a minute, doctor. I think that Steve, you wait a minute. What you think has no bearing whatever on your condition. Yet in time, the scientists were able to demonstrate validity for their hypothesis and in turn earned the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. It is worth emphasizing that if someone comes along and tries to challenge an accepted consensus that has considerable data to back it, 
then the methods should be subject to harsh skepticism, at least initially. Much of what gets published in the scientific literature is simply preliminary findings, which then have to be sorted out by the scientific community at large to see if such results have any merit. It's also worth repeating that the thinking that existed before these scientific discoveries were made did not really represent scientific consensus at the time so much as it did pre-consensus thinking. Remember, scientific consensus is when mountains of data have accumulated that converge towards a similar conclusion. So common assumptions by scientists based on an absence of good data is not the same as a scientific consensus. Sometimes we hear the argument that because science was wrong before, we can discard the current scientific consensus as it could be wrong. The cases of Galileo or Ignaz Semmelweis are usually brought up to draw some sort of comparison about how scientists who try to threaten the establishment have been suppressed or subverted in their attempts to update the scientific paradigm. This is often known as the Galileo Gambit, a version of the association fallacy. There are a number of responses to these rather poor comparisons. Firstly, two words, wrong century. Galileo was oppressed by the Catholic Church in the early 17th century for his advocacy of heliocentrism, that the Earth and other planets in our solar system revolve around the Sun, as it was considered heretical at the time. This of course does not happen today to scientists who posit theories that are antithetical to religious teachings, at least in the West. Semmelweis, on the other hand, was the first to posit what would later be developed into the germ theory of disease by Louis Pasteur. Semmelweis's initial findings in the mid-19th century were largely rejected by the medical community at the time, despite various publications that statistically documented the reductions of mortality from hand washing. Yet these findings conflicted with accepted wisdom of the time, partly due to a lack of understanding of a plausible mechanism at the time, but also due to incredulity and stubbornness of the scientific establishment. And the findings were largely ignored until after Semmelweis died when Pasteur formulated the germ theory. There is no real modern comparison for this happening. But promoters of unproven science, or pseudoscience today, do like to use both of these historical examples to try to argue that modern hypotheses, often in medicine, that are not accepted by the mainstream scientific community, are simply being oppressed and that eventually it will be inevitable to embrace their miracle cures or what have you. Often there is an attempt to paint the scientific community as dogmatic, close-minded, locked into a particular social ideology or somehow corrupt. This is all a deflection from having to actually produce good quality evidence to support such alternative views, which inevitably would displace accepted theories if they can be substantiated, as we've seen with the examples I provided earlier. It might take time, whether due to lack of sufficient data, scrutiny from the scientific establishment, or even socio-economic pressures that cause certain institutions to oppose such scientific realities. That begs one question that I'll deal with in part three of this trilogy. Can the scientific consensus be corrupted? Whether bought out by political or corporate interests or simply due to systemic pressures as part of a formal conspiracy or not. Meet me in the next video for that.